All right, welcome everyone. Uh, Today we have with us Daniel J. Lewis, host of the Audacity to Podcast. If you're looking for more information about Daniel and uh, podcasting and a bunch of other stuff we're going to be talking about here, including stuff around his online courses, you can find him and and all of that at theaudacitytopodcast.com. Uh, welcome, Daniel. Great to have you here. Uh, I know you're you're quite experienced in the podcasting space, but also in creating your own online courses and in SEO and SEO for podcasts. Uh, so really excited. I think there's a lot of things that our audience here who's into course creation and some of them even into podcasting. I know one of the guys actually even here in our office, is he's got his own online courses, plus he's into podcasting and got his own podcast. So I think lots of interest from our audience and all this kind of stuff. So excited to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Greg. Yeah, I I love podcasting. And there are a lot of ways that podcasting and creating courses really tie together very nicely. Yeah. And so you've done both. So you've got courses, uh, mostly for podcasters, right around SEO for podcasting, and then your podcast master course. Um, How, how, what, what are the kind of similarities that you see there? I mean, I, I, I can see tons right away already. But what's the big things having really experienced both of them that you see? Well, when you're creating a podcast, you really need to focus on content and presenting that content well. That's the same thing you would do if you're presenting a course. And there could be times where you could treat your podcast as a course. Maybe you do a little mini series in your podcast. So you're dedicating five episodes to covering the five different aspects of this particular idea. And so you break it down into five separate episodes, you segment it a little bit, you plan out, you have an outline for what's the information you want to share, what do you want people to learn from this? You could even take that episode as is and turn that into a course or repurpose the same outline to make into a video course or a screencast or something like that. But when you learn how to create good content, especially teaching content, and you learn how to present that well, then it's a very seamless transition into taking that same skill and making a course. You're just distributing it slightly differently. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned kind of planning things out. This is something I I bump up against and see a lot of people struggle with in the early days of creating courses is when you're um, just issues around motivation and planning and sort of mapping that out. And I'm sure with a podcast, you probably don't come out and say, okay, I'm going to produce episode one and launch it on iTunes. And then I'll start thinking about episode two, right? So and same thing with the course, right? You're not going to put out lesson one and then be like, okay, what should I teach in lesson two? Uh, How do you how do you kind of deal with that, that bigger picture plan and even the the structure and the motivation of getting it all done. Yeah, with with a podcast, many podcasts are hosted like that. Even my own show, although I know in general where I'm going and I have a list of 100 upcoming episodes I could cover each week, I still make the decision, what am I going to cover this week? But when I created my SEO for podcasters course, I initially thought it would be maybe a three hour long course Mm -hmm. because I thought, okay, I'll talk about these things. This is my basic outline of the different lessons and modules in the course. But I didn't completely have every module planned out when I started my recording. So when I got halfway through it, I was already at about four hours of content. And the more I started working on it, the more I realized this is going to be a very long in-depth course, much more information than I originally planned. And the fault there was on me because I didn't fully plan everything. I just thought, oh yeah, I'll talk about um, the Yoast SEO plugin. And that'll be half an hour. No, that turned into a three hour long complete (laughs) walk to set up the plugin because I realized I really want to show people how exactly to do this, what each option does that they need to know. And if I had really planned out further, when I started, then I would have a better idea of where to go and maybe could have optimized my time more instead of making a 10 hour long course, maybe made a five hour long course that presented just as much value, but without so many words. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, <laughs> certainly the value in planning there. That's interesting. Okay. So in the podcasting world, you're kind of planning not as far ahead, but in the, in the course world, definitely it sounds like you had a little bit more uh, planned ahead, but it just as it fleshed out, it became bigger than a bigger beast than it than it was initially intended. Yeah, it really depends on your approach. Like with podcasting, you could approach it episode by episode and you wait until it's that week to plan out the content for that episode. You may plan out, okay, here are what the next five episodes will be about, but you don't know exactly what you'll say in episode five until you get there. Kind of like the way that TV shows are often written. They often know the general story arc they want to follow and where they want to be by the end of the season 
but how they're going to get there in every episode along the way they may not know or especially if they have multiple seasons they often don't know where they're going to be in season three while they're writing season one but the more they can plan that out and in a sense tell a story whether that be in your podcast whether that be in a course whether that be entertainment or writing yeah the more you plan that entire story the better everything will be right so so maybe uh the producers of game of thrones don't actually know exactly how when danny's gonna ride in on her dragons and save the world right <laughs> yeah <laughs> just that she will do it we know she's gonna do it we just don't know when or what season even um okay so on the seo side so you have this course on seo for podcasters uh is there stuff that you would take out of that and apply to your online course and i'm asking because i know our audience uh, SEO, it, it can be a scary thing to get into and there's lots of simple stuff you can do and then you can get really advanced into it and, and turn it into a whole career. Is there, is there things you'd pull out of what you've learned on SEO for podcasting that you started to apply to your course that worked well or you'd recommend people doing? Yeah, one of the things is really the most important text on the internet, the most important thing you can do for SEO is to create great titles. Yes, there are a lot of other techniques and other fields and metadata you can use and much of this stuff changes, but everything really comes back to a good title. That's a title that's compelling as well as descriptive and includes those keywords. Like the course itself mm -hmm. went through a little bit of SEO on the course after I released it. Initially it was, and I still call it to this day, SEO for podcasters. That's kind of its nickname, but no one is really searching SEO for podcasters. So it's right. not that good of a title. So I changed the title and expanded it. So I get some more SEO from that. And the full title is now something like how to make your podcast findable and grow your audience with SEO for podcasters. Right. Because that's really what people are looking for. Yeah, it has those keywords that people type in like grow my audience, make my podcast findable, mm -hmm. find my podcast, that kind of thing. That's, that's funny because when I talk to people even about designing their curriculum, before you plan out that roadmap for your courses, I always talk about uh, what is, what's, why is someone taking your course? How do they, how's their life going to be different when they're done it? And, and to your point about the title, if you start to think, what is someone going to type into Google? That's an even better way of looking at it too, of because people ne won't necessarily go SEO for podcasts. They'll say, okay, the end result I want is people are going to find my podcast. So that's, that's what they're looking for. And it sounds like that's the need you're meeting. Yeah. What is the solution your course or your podcast or your content solves? Yeah. And then put that in the title because no one it knows the solution if they're searching for the solution. They, they're looking yeah. for something. They know the question. They don't know the answer. So the answer may be SEO for podcasters. They don't know that. They just know they want their podcast to stand out. They want to make it findable. That's where the title of the course or podcast or anything else you're creating really comes into play is giving them that answer that they're looking for. That's a great way to look at it. That's good. Um, okay. Another, so another area on the podcasting side that I think might play into the course side, and I'm curious if you used it at all is you have guests obviously on your podcast. Did you, and that can be a great way to generate content and knowledge. Did you pull any of that into the courses that you've created or whether it just be the knowledge that you learned through the podcast or it, it be um, actually inviting guests and interviewing them. Um, have you done any of that kind of stuff on the course side? Uh, it's funny that you say I have guests on my podcast, obviously. Uh, actually, not obviously because my podcast does not have guests. I know there's this common assumption that I'm going to start a podcast and interview people. Yeah. We, the radio is often interviewing people. We hear of many podcasts that are interview-based podcasts. I don't actually host an interview-based podcast. And in fact, I tell people for the Audacity to Podcast, that is, I don't do interviews. I do conversations. An interview is where you're asking someone and then you let them speak. A conversation is where there's some back and forth, some shared presentation. So for uh, the course, it is all me speaking. I didn't bring in a guest or interview people. I might do that someday in the future, actually do interviews or maybe a, a co-presented presentation inside of the course. But uh, for growing a course, bringing someone else in is a great idea. Not only does that mean that an, an additional perspective is part of this, but it also means there's someone else who is potentially equally invested in the course and its success 
And depending on your agreements with that person, they may be just as interested in promoting the course as you would be. So collaborating can be a great way to build a course better and promote it better as well. Uh, the, I'm curious, you know, you, you're pretty successful with everything with your podcast and the courses and, and having that online presence. Have you hit point and not everyone in our audience is at that point. Some people are, are killing it and other people are just getting, other people are getting started. Have you had moments of uh, failure or doubt along the way in building this personal business? Oh yeah, regularly, because I see some people, the marketers in the space that are having huge success and they've got this big following, they're making lots of money. And I see myself more as an artist that I'm more concerned with the quality of the work, the accuracy of the information. So it's very much an art to me. And I attract people because of that, that I'm not all about the hype and the marketing. Hobbyists listen to me as well as professionals because they can both share, whereas hobbyists may not be as interested in the marketing hype. So some of the ways that I failed in trying to release this art is often focusing too much on the perfection or trying to do too much of it myself, whether that be find the, the perfect WordPress plugin for my particular needs instead of using some third party tool like the tool that you provide uh, or trying to do all of the editing myself and spending days and weeks on that instead of contracting that out to someone else. The failure for me comes when I focus on the wrong thing. Fair enough. Okay. So then do you, so you, do you do much contracting out on the, I mean, on the podcast side or on the course side? Yeah, what I do now is I have a producer, so I can focus on the recording and the preparation of the information. So re recording it is just a simple matter of setting up my studio and turning on the camera, and then someone else handles the editing and they know my style enough and I take into consideration how they'll edit. So I try and make it as easy as possible for them to edit. Now, some side tips here, I was doing video where the camera was focused on me during certain portions of the lessons. And this is at least an SEO for podcasters and other stuff I do. And for my notes, what I had is I would use an iPad and I use the app Workflowy. What I really like about Workflowy is it's lists inside of lists inside of lists. So it was very easy to have my SEO for podcasters list. And then inside of that, have each module inside of that, each point. So it was very easy to narrow down to exactly the section of information I wanted to share and not be overwhelmed by all of my other notes. So I could focus on that, present with that. But the problem when I created SEO for podcasters is I had this on my iPad and I did not want to look down. And I didn't <laughs> want to have the iPad visible. and. There are ways to work around that, having a different setup from what I had. Um, and my studio is very different now from what I had back then. But what could work really well for many people making a video course is even if you don't script your course, have a teleprompter that sits there directly in front of the camera. So you're looking directly into the camera, but that teleprompter could simply have your notes or your outline on it. Yeah. So instead of you're having to look down and try and remember what was point five, yeah. you point five right there. So you can more easily make a transition looking directly into the camera instead of having to look off screen, look down at, or look at your notes or anything like that. And I know some people think it's okay to look off to the side, look down at their notes, anything like that. That's fine. I chose to not look away from the camera. And because of that and the tools I had at my disposal, uh, my uh, use back then that meant a lot of editing points as I would be going along I was really passionate I was on point number three and then I couldn't remember wait which one is next point four point five so I'd have to look down at my notes and that would become an edit point for me yeah yeah that's that's a good point it's interesting because they have uh they have actually some pretty good teleprompters now that go with the ipad so you can just pop your ipad into it and it's kind of just a mirror that pops on top of it you know a two-way or see-through mirror that goes that works with the ipad and you can use it that way and definitely i've i've done uh we have a teleprompter here and i've done it with full scrolling like newsreel where you're just reading for people and i've also done it where they just have the notes uh i find the 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 only bad thing you can do is go somewhere in between where your notes are really long and sort of full sentences, but not exactly what you want to say. So you yeah. start reading it and then you're just stumbling. And so it's either to me, it's like super quick bullet points or 
fully scripted, but you go try and go in between and your brain just melts. <laughs> Yeah, unless you're really comfortable doing that kind of thing. But it always helps if you're going to read something from the screen. It helps if you are the person who wrote that and you write it yeah. in the way you speak instead of trying yeah. to write it perfect grammar. Yeah. The teleprompter app I found, I've got to tell you about this because this might yeah. be really helpful to other people, especially doing any kind of solo video shoots. It is called Prompt Smart. Okay. It's for iOS. What's beautiful about this and why it's especially good for single shooters is that most teleprompter software for iPad, iOS, anything like that can be tethered to a remote. It could be tethered to a Bluetooth foot pad, something like that, where you can control the speed or the scroll, something like that. But that's something else you have to think about and potentially something else you have to do with your hands. Yeah. Well, the way Prompt Smart works and the app is, I think, $13 in the App Store, is it uses the microphone built into the device listens to your voice and has text to speech recognition wow rather it has speech to text recognition so that it looks at the script and it scrolls as it knows you're reading something and if you go off script it simply pauses where it is and once it hears that you're reading from the script again then it resumes its scrolling that's so amazing if i even had my simple list of 10 items and i say number one blah, 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 blah. It'll just stay there, hovered on number one until I say number two and I read the exact same thing that's written on the screen. It's been wonderful to use that because then I don't have to have someone else managing the speed. I don't have to feel rushed. I can go on tangents if I want to and it scrolls nicely for me at the speed that I'm talking. So it's a wonderful investment, $13 or so for that app. That's great. We, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely check that one out. That's really cool. Cause I've been the guy, I've been the guy trying to control the speed and we have our <laughs> software, it will save the speed. So you do a practice run through and then it saves the, the pace, uh, whether you're, you know, up tempo, down tempo throughout the script. Uh, and then you can play it back at that exact pace, but then who goes through things, you know, the second time exactly the same way you did the first time. So you end up having to go through a few takes because of that sometimes. So that's great. I'll check that one out. Prompt smart. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, another one, another one before we're uh, run out of time here, just wanted to ask you quickly around uh, how you how you kind of came to decisions around pricing of your course. It's always an interesting one, you know, being in different spaces and how much exposure and brand and, and value you have in your course and, and sort of where you priced it and how you made those decisions about pricing, if you don't mind getting into that stuff. Yeah, pricing is surely one of those hardest things. And for me, it was difficult too, because when I first started announcing the course, I was thinking this will be a three to four hour long course. Then when I created the course, it was 10 hours. I spent a lot more work. I felt like there was a lot more value. So the initial price was $97. But when I first announced it, I did some kind of pre-order special that made it, I think $75, something like that. Mm -hmm. Now it's $297. The main thing about pricing is uh, to make it what it's worth to your audience, not what it's worth to you. Don't think about how much time you put into it or how much it costs you. But it is something you have to think about from a business perspective, because of course you need to recoup your costs and such, but don't let that drive what that actual price is. Think about the value to your audience and that can also help in how you market it because people can understand this is what I'll get, this is what it's worth to me and you have to convince them of that. One of the other things to consider is your flexibility with that price. Do you have the flexibility to share the revenue if you're using a tool that charges a certain amount based on how much you charge, like they take 30% of the revenue of your course? Or what if you have affiliates with your course? Or do you have enough flexibility in the price that you could put it on sale every now and then? When my course first launched, it was $97. Then I later on raised it to $300. But the thing was, I told all of my subscribers, I'm going to raise the price because this has a lot more information than I thought I was going to have. So I'm going to raise the price on this date. If you want to get it before I raise the price, buy it now. Biggest sales day ever <laughs> before I raise the price. You know, the second biggest sales day was when I put it on sale. Uh. <laughs> and the sale price was higher than that original launch price. Right. But it's that perception of value. And I'm yeah. not talking about doing weird marketing hacks here to overprice something. I I'm not yeah. a fan of that. Yep. Yeah. It's you really do have to figure out what is this worth to your audience. 
And you have that flexibility to put things on sale, give a promo code, anything like that. And that can help increase that perception of value as well as give people the urgency or the, the motivation to finally jump on it because they realize, oh yeah, if I get this now, I can save $50 or 10% or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen the same thing in my own personal course. I started at $29 and over the course, it, it I did it over the course of a couple of years, but I worked it up to $389, which was my magic number and I've left it there. And I do do some sales and they definitely do big uh, jumps, but each price increase. So I went 29, 59, 79 and so on. And every time I did it, I did the same thing. I said, the price is going up next week. I've added some value. It's great. You should pick it up now. Last chance to get it at 29 or 59 and, and huge jumps in sales every time I did it. But the other cool thing I found is when I, every time I moved it to a higher price point, I would actually sell more copies at the higher price point. So I think there was a real, um, I was actually underselling the course at that. I was giving people, they were perceiving it as a crappy product because it was priced at a crappy level, basically. So when it went higher, they thought, oh, this must be one of those premier courses. We'll get that one. Yeah, that's the other thing too. That's crazy that people are more willing to buy something that's more expensive and less expensive. And that applies in so many different areas. I even heard that uh, wine tasting, uh, they'll label bottles and say this one is worth $45 per bottle, this one's worth $5. And statistically, people will favor the more expensive one simply because of the price, even if they lied about the price or the quality or wine experts say it's better. But it, yeah, it is about perception of value and what is the actual value you deliver. Yeah, definitely. It, and it can make a huge difference, even, you know, in terms of your revenues in the long run, obviously tiny increases in, or changes in price make it such an impact on that. Great. Uh, so what's what's coming up next for you? I mean, you've got, uh, is it, what are your big projects now that you're working on? Is it the, is it the SEO for podcasting course? Is it uh, obviously continuing with uh, the audacity of the podcast? What's, uh, what's on your plate these days? Well, my business is helping podcasters. So I'm looking for new ways and products and services I can create to help podcasters. And my latest thing, and this is my big project right now, is called Podcaster Society, which is a combination of membership community as well as courses. So it's a special group for people who have already started their podcast. So it doesn't teach them how to podcast. It teaches them how to improve their podcast. So it's everything you need after episode one. And a big part of that will be courses, courses that will be available to annual members who will have, for example, access to SEO for podcasters. As long as they maintain their membership, they get access to that. Or also courses for those who join immediately. So if they join and they're wondering, okay, where do I go? There, there are all of these courses, all of these tutorials, all of these resources, where do I start? So I'm developing a course right now for the next time I reopen Podcaster Society in mid-2016 to new members, uh, that there will be a course for them to know, all right, here are the five ways I can start right now to improve my podcast. And it would be then a five-week course, each week focusing on one of the different cornerstones of what makes a great podcast. And that kind of thing, I found that people really like having something to do and they like knowing a progression it's great to have the kid in the candy store, <laughs> but we can often be overwhelmed and not really know where to go first, what to get, what, how much to get of what thing, where to focus. And so a course can really make that easier to guide them through here's step one, step two, step three. And once you complete this, now you have this whole library and now cherry pick whatever you need. Yeah. And I, 100% agree on that side of that exploratory learning has been proven time and time again to not be particularly effective for people because Google and YouTube are your perfect solution to that. And people, you know, you can, you can pick up tidbits here, but there's a reason why courses do well because someone hands you the, hands you the curriculum and says, I'm going to take you from A to B and you're going to get that beautiful result at the end that you've been looking for. And you, you can't guarantee that searching around. It'll often take you way longer to ever get there if you're just searching around uh, exploring. So even within the context of your community, it's great that you provide that guidance. And I love the fact that, I mean, you're bringing in so much stuff to that concept that uh, I preach all the time and, and love the concept of, of like uh, having that community concept there where uh, you're bringing people in to share ideas and, and have that community 
uh, having different courses and a progression of courses, having a recurring revenue stream, which is great for you that people can have access to it for as long or as little as they need access to it. So that's, it's all really good stuff for the whole business model of online courses and, and even in adding great value to your students. So good to hear that you're doing it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about it. It's got a great team uh, inside. I call it a team because that's what they, they are. They're a team now. They like to help each other. Uh, I'm their leader of this tribe. I've given, given them the ways to connect with each other as well as ways that they can learn from me for this, this common goal of improving their podcast. And that's at podcastersociety.com. Excellent. That's a great way to look at it. I love the team concept and sort of building that tribe around you. <laughs> uh, Excellent. Well, Daniel, uh, really a pleasure having you here. Uh, for everyone watching, if you want to learn a little bit more about Daniel or um, SEO, uh, whether it's for podcasting or, or other means, SEO for podcasting, you can find that at the Audacity to Podcast. And then, of course, there's your podcast there as well. And also uh, information about your, uh, your community as well. So uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, really appreciate you being here. You're very welcome, Greg. I had a great time. Thanks.